welcome to Marin Poets Live. I'm Neshama Franklin. I work at the Fairfax Library and I love poetry. After this program airs on TV, it will appear on the Marin Free Library website as a digital archive which also features biographies of the poets and links to our collection. Today we feature poet Pat Nelson. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. It's good to be here. Good. Here we are. And as always, I'm a quiver for a Marin poem, if you have one. Okay. Um, I do have a poem. It um, was derived from a field trip I took with the Environmental Forum of Marin. They take you around and show you all the different trees and the ah. wetland biospheres in Marin. Mm. And this one is about the alder tree. Um, the alder tree is a tree sacred to the, dru the druids whose alder pipes gave rise to the legend of whistling up the wind. The alder is also a pioneer tree after fire, colonizing the edges of streams. Mm. So, alder. After fire, alder first, edgewise in the earth. In air and water, two shapes move, lamps of angle, surface, leaf. Wood of bridge and flute dwells in the flooded naked edge where air in the green wood makes a sound and a shape. From stream and air, pull with wood the elements. Let wind pass through the tool, like, lifted like a thumb or moon. A man goes single, finned with magic, through the raining, sliding air. Colors beat in the sky like flying animals. The veined man, ringing in the wind, sings to wing and eye and notch of leaf, each small motion and its many shadows. That's so sylvan. <laughs> now, the vain man, is that V-A-N-E, like a, 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 not vain, but oh, a yeah. weather vainish. Well, I, I was thinking of actual veins. Oh, veins! <laughs> See, that's the thing about poetry in the ear. You don't know. <laughs> ah. Have you ever seen an, elder, an alder pipe? I have not. I've just heard oh, about them. I'm so curious. <laughs> Who would have thunk? <laughs> yes. yes. What else do you have for us? Uh, well, this one is about the oak tree. And this is also based on the Celtic calendar as the, other, the previous one was. The Druids saw the oak as a dimension door and they considered it sacred. Uh, Druids and priestesses entered the future by listening to the oak leaves and the sounds of the wrens and the branches. Mm. So, oak. As the white ear carries the song away, a starlight twists in the branch until it is gone. So the door of the oak goes dark and bird and leaf begin to move. There is light adrift in the dark, sift of bright grain in a wheel, a chaff of noises winnowed in the ear's small sifting sea. The human words are small and random, easily forgotten, broken in the wall. But the door of the oak is fierce with music, sings to the woman's slant and branching awe. The priestess widens at the door, her flowering, altering map, her vision large on its little hinge, her birded air and roaring star. Oh, I love the vision large on that little hinge. I mean, I will not look at a tree without thinking of a portal now. And <sighs> boy, did it take you to places. What, um, what wild visions. You're a pagan at heart, perhaps? Well, maybe so. <laughs> I think, I mean, it's coming out. It's coming out. I think this is based on the work I did with uh, the Lawrence Hart and John Hart and their activist mm -hmm. seminars. What is that all about? Well, it's a seminar that's been going on actually since the 1930s. Wow. Started by Lawrence Hart as kind of a WPA project. Mm. And he systematically went through modernist poetry and developed teaching techniques to teach people how to write like the modernists. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't modern no more, but it's, no. it sounds very fresh minted. Yeah. Anyway. He, he taught people, one of the first things he taught people to do was to write what he called a double image, where you combine two very disparate things uh -huh. and try to accord them something like you do in, with music. Wow. So. I didn't know that. And of course, it's in there all over the place, bopping around in your poems so far. Yeah, I hope you, so. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's definitely there. Okay. So what, what, 
comes next? Uh, well, I'm, um, this is a series of nature poems, mm -hmm. and we're so lucky in Marin to live right near the bay and the sea. Yes. So this poem is called Sea. It doesn't break or flower, this diagonal windy sea. Out of its motion walk things oblique and noiseless. Here the imperfect evolve. On a planet of crooked oceans, directions fill. Here are the motions, driftwoods long and moteless turning, existence slipping like a bracelet, untoothed, untoothed sudden shining jaw, predators widening like lights. Here water revises the boundary, leaves on the rocks small and jumbled animals. In broken water, starfish, moving moon thin things. Here sea crosses night, a wave disturbs with its soft moonlight. Here it arranges the day, horizon of knobs, silvered, moving. When you leave the sea, it leaves a swaying in your tangled ear. Behind you, the gull, two still wings, shifting the weight across. Mm. I never thought of the ocean as imperfect. <laughs> That's, I, and I'm very interested in imperfection these days because perfection is illusion and perfection is static and the ocean is as far from static as anything you find and there's lots of movement in that poem. That's exactly right. Yes, yes, and then you have, there's something so clean about a gull. It's mm -hmm. a kind of iconic, so you, you, you end with that gull and we all say, oh, we know that gull. We can relax, perhaps, <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah, they're beautiful animals, and they seem to be still sometimes, even when they're yes, not. Yes, yes. They're so sharp-edged. Yes. Yes. Next. OK, this one is called Green Sturgeon. It's continuing the environmental line here. Mm -hmm. The bottom, no dazzle of line or shadow. The depth unbolts the eye, and there is only motion. The prey, small and burrowing by distance or distraction goes sideways into absence. Little outlines flicker in the dark. Sturgeon low in its scarred hide, cartilage green and knobbed with sensate dangling threads, turns at the lip like foliage without error. Goes filled and wordless in the ringing sea, a shaded heartbeat, a weight of particulars, implies with age and shape a pristine ancient water where there is only time and everything resounds. Mm. Sturgeons are very ancient fish, I believe. Where, where did you get all that information about the, being a sturgeon? Did you, was it in the uh, aquarium? Was it reading? What, where did it come to you? I was doing a habitat petition in connection with my ah. work, and there were several fish that were involved, but I just fell in love with the green sturgeon. Yes, I can, I can feel, I feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. You know that Elizabeth Bishop f fish poem. I mean, that, yes. that's the, your basic fish poem. And, but all our glorious fish have many babies, and that's, yes. yours is one of them. And they're so old. That's yes, one thing I love. Yes, they are. About. And kind of battered and grumpy. I'm so glad you spoke of the scars. <laughs> yes. What's next? Um, this one is called Extinction. I have a simple eye. It breaks things with its premonitions. At dusk, the word, the ghost shapes. Exhalation of lion, pale grasses, sliding sturgeon. A strew of broken moonlight through the leaves. The animals pass by, single file, in and out of their gleaming moment on the beating edge of visibility. From somewhere far away, with no word left to lift or fill the shadow, see your open mouth, its motion small and indecipherable, small as a blowing leaf. Among the sounds and the news, the accurate, the loss, the overwhelming word, Birds fly on in the storms that part them from the coast. The flock small and still on your eyes curve, traveling. What an elegiac poem with an, a, a political under roar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very subtle, but very strong. And I love that image of just they're, they're moving across. You know, it's kind of like a funeral procession. Yeah. 
Yeah. And by the time you realize there's a problem, it's sometimes too late. Of course, of course. And the idea of the little mouth going, <laughs> and they have no idea what it is. But that little mouth reflects your big heart <laughs> and, and your deep concern. So what's next? Um, I have a couple of poems about, the, the preceding poems were nature poems. Mm -hmm. These are poems about how we make sense of nature or by extension everything that we see. Yes. And this one is called Lines. They appear at birth, a motion edge to edge, tide of points and color. With lines the eye elaborates, grasses emerge moving in their stripes. Colors pulled like sudden water, vista thin as a bowstring. The eye simplifies and straightens. Waist-high man bent by a flow of water, sails that flower and bow towards home, yellow in a wind of salts. The line gathers by their many faces, all the brilliant-sided creatures, the animals lit and turned by a destination. O oh, resonant line, place upon the world a lid of eye and memory. Oh, that, uh, th th again, that's a kind of an anthem at the end. That, that's what it sounds like to me. Um, but it must have been very challenging to come up with the first little peak of you don't know what it is, but you're going to find out, you know, the nature, the mysterious nature of the line. You know, yeah. going back into basically infancy. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, the wonder of poetry is that you see it as fresh as you can. So you're tapping into infant wonder to make a poem like that, Yeah, <laughs> which is lovely. You make lines without even realizing that you're uh, doing Yeah, thank <laughs> God. Yes. I mean, we, you know, otherwise it's too self-conscious. Yeah. Yes, what comes next? This is called Something Permanent and True, which is an, I, another idea we use to navigate, I think. Mm. Infer it from a map so marked that it gathers up the jointed roads and makes them wise. Infer it from a fossil that endures its stone, a darker imprint in the overtaking light, a skin starred with cold. Infer it as your home, a threshold fastened to a garden and a destination, it holds a face of small, felicitous lines, a smile ajar in many jams. Infer it even from a lie, words that slant and gleam, dividing somewhere out of sight the small and true horizon. From a scatter of light in a ditch, infer a moon uncrowned, a stone uncluttered moving past, the straight line in a comb of crooked words. Mm. So those are all your comforts, um, but you don't get them by grasping them. You get them by noticing them uh, always on the slant. Well, that's true. I mean, true, that's, yeah. that, and that's, you know, and because they come and they go, you can't gather them up. You just appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And the, the word infer is so kind of intellectual, but the stuff you're inferring is so visceral. So it sets up a very interesting dynamic. That's that heart influence again. Oh boy, <laughs> let's hear it for heart. Okay, let's keep going. This one is called Locomotion. To the non-believer, there is something odd in the mode of locomotion. The painting's pencil-footed saint standing on a lighted miracle. The cyclist turning with his feet a slotted shadow. It is sunset on the road outward, the sun at every turn, gold on the long and leafwise bay. At each reflected light, the known and the usual, one glimmer upon another, suggesting some great arc. We talk of strangers who bring us home, move us to some moment changing color like a wave, to, con con to clairvoyance or to courage. We talk of the storm-wrecked fisherman on the verge of the leaning boat, who saw on the darkened water someone's floating eyeglasses and jumped into the dark. Water falls on the sand as if close to the ear or the ear's understanding. We talk of home, not house or slant of hill, but the not quite language that we dream in and the unexpected daylight listener. There is a shine in the ordinary, a color we have not achieved. 
a place where the looking drops suddenly into clarity, like seabird entering the sea. We, the believers in the wish for largeness, and the cold at the edge of that wish. Mm, that's again so delicious. There are lines in there I, I kept wanting to stop you and say, I want that again, I want that again, because it, it just, uh, it's, it's celebrating the ordinary, um, which is not ordinary if you celebrate it, yeah. which is the paradox <laughs> of it. There was a woman I sat next to at work, and she told me the story of the fisherman that jumped into the water. It happened to be yeah. her husband. Oh. <laughs> and he didn't know how much courage he had until he made himself do that. Yes. He yes. didn't even make himself do that. He just did it. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. He retrieved the glasses and brought them back? He brought the person back. Oh, the, oh he saw the glasses. <laughs> And he found the person. And he found the person. Wow, yes. that's even richer. Yeah. I mean, I who cannot see much without my glasses <laughs> thought the glasses might be enough. So um, we have about 11 minutes, so let's see wh what you have for us okay. in that time. I have a couple of poems about archetypes, mm -hmm. and this one goes on from the sea. Sea sighting, lifted once by sea, a spine, a skin that seemed to fasten its hair to shadow. Legend made monstrous the skin of particulars, which ne neither changed the animal nor made the story false. It's right to see that a glance with its bundle of words moves everything. Also not wrong to see by the small of the light, to look at the dark, to look with all the darks at water's footless images and through and under. Not wrong to avert like eyes the provable nouns to make against the sea a song, oracular and wide. Mm. Uh, th your exhortations, <laughs> the not wrongs and the infers, it, it, it's a very particular and delightful style. You know, it, it's almost, reminds me, I, it came into my mind like a sampler, you know. Th this, this is stuff you really need to know and we're gonna repeat it so you get it. <laughs> It's an interesting way to look at it. Right. Um, this one is a poem for one of the activist poets that recently passed away, Fred Ostrander. And I view him as the poet of archetypal time. It's a phrase he used in now, his poetry. Now, are you reading his poem, or is this poem dedicated to him? This is dedicated Good. to him. I mean, fine, but yeah. Yeah. whatever. I needed to know. OK, it's called Pictograph. Okay. On the leaning desert rock, marked in jointed paints, a vanished hunter without envy, wish, or eye. We are clumsy at his stone, misshapen. We cannot vanish into archetypal time, the distillation that both calls and saddens. We are here, the accident irrevocable. In moving light, our shapes expand and narrow among the other large and beating animals of now. Oh, the small hole of the eye, the small hole into spirit, the grief of all the shapes between. Mm. That's just delicious. I feel bathed in something that has lots of illumination but keeps coming down to where we are, the simplicity of where we are. I mean, you're taking very complicated concepts um, and making them sing. Um, oh. without complication, which is pretty nifty, oh, thank I you. think, <laughs> I think. So let's continue. This one is called Angels. It's another archetype, I think. As if on horseback, angels lean into the shapes of the world. Cliff, wave, spiral of bird. Winged forms brighten like a lens. Light is tall in the lift of hair and knee. Tall among stars and echoing leaves. Tall even in the word, the little helix of their written names. From height or edge, the faces occupy flowering, each burning in its canyon, prophetic, still, bronzed with meaning, each eye wide, collector of all forms to come. Mm. Why don't you speak just a little about the nature of archetype? Like, like can you say this is an archetype of in that poem? just for education, or is it just basically something ancient that appears? How would you define or speak of ar archetypes since it appears in your poems? 
I, actually, I haven't thought about it okay. in such a conscious way. Uh -huh. It's it's old things and things that speak to you over time. I think. What it, it, old things and things that speak to you. What else could you ask for? For a very good definition. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a couple of poems that I've written after reading The Inferno by Dante with a group. Mm. I don't know if there's time to read them or... Um, well, we have um, six plus minutes, so read oh, okay. one, see what happens. Okay. Okay. This is called The Road, After Dante, Inferno, Canto One. Enter with your trinket word where colors open upward urgently as birds and the wish for, for the mountain sings as, as if it faces forward. Pull from the dream the images of peak and tree, open their lamps among the windy surfaces, the scarred and tangled maps that are yours. Starting at the middle, nudge a disappearing path. Where the way is broken, you must break. Stippled pilgrim with your heel upon your shadow and the wood shadow. The traveler is where he begins, not of dreams like a lumbering animal, red image in the labyrinth, distraction multiplied and sung. The traveler is his end, the far, cold, indifferent mountain, the power to stop among the lights apart from the animals, and every dark that roars and turns below the prayer. Are you a painter as well? I mean, there's so much light and there's so much color. Or are you a painter of words? Well, just a painter of words. Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's so visual. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, and light is essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have time for another of these. Okay. Poems. Yes. This one is about Ulysses. Um, Dante met, met a lot of historical or mythical figures in the underworld. And, mm -hmm. He tells a uni unique story about Ulysses' last voyage in which he sailed away from home and family in his old age and drowned with his crew within sight of the mountain of pur purgatory. And Ulysses, Ulysses is a favorite of mine, so yeah. I have to write about him. In old age, he laid it down again, the adventure like a gamble, his ship mast dwindling, dwindling upward into light on the flat and singing sea. He rode the faith that once had shown and sl he rode the fate that once had shown and slid around him like a water, rolling its odd images. He went out past the edge, sailing like a stub among the bigger, brighter gods. Escaped those who loved and kept him small and satisfied. And yes, he did come upon, like a mirror or a minor shadow, the vast upward mountain of the saved. But here he lost. The turning sea, the answer. Like the horn that winds the sound in circles until it is loud and bright and final, it pulled him down, pulled him down at last into the refrain of who he is, drowned him with his old and striving gods who love the sly thief, the merely smart escape, love the brave and presumptuous who blow and tap the world like a drunken orchestra. And this is from Dante's viewpoint. Like death, the favored watcher makes a story of the sunken hero, twisting without volume, baffled form moving as if splashing, the lost still diving, makes an exit straight and dim as starlight where all the blue ghosts leave, the path around them closing like a seam. Men bone colored and still, women off key in their hanging shapes, no longer in that fiction where the place can change. What about the women off key? Tell me, what, what, what are they singing off key? Or are, or, what, what, I, it's so intriguing. It's, a, it, it's an attempt at the double image. Um, the women are compared to music. Where yeah. It's sort of slanted and not yes. quite right. Yes. Which is the way your shape is after you're no longer alive. Right, right. I, I mean, again, it was so beautiful, and I just wanted a little exposition. We have a couple of minutes. Do you have a, a shorty? I do. Goody. <laughs> <laughs> this one is called Bullseye. Sun, bugle, black storm on four 
pegs of bone, sled of furious muscle, habit of noise and, re and rage that implies enemies invisible and large. Angry creatures hunt the motion, figures that bend, unbend like holes in the blinded light. They raid the rim where outlines flicker. Oh, crack your eye this way, your yellow dandelion eye, myopic fractured star. Hang our image rocking, bell of stillness and charge. Whoa. These are such rich poems. Um, it's, th they're ones actually I wanted to see and chew over because they're so, they're, they're pretty intricate. And so um, I know that people will then turn to your books, I hope, and read them to get those double images again. But what you gave us especially is the music of them. And there's so many lines that sound very classical to me. You oh, know, I hear you. pentameter in there. Oh. I just, it's just lovely to, to have straddled the centuries like that. We are done, Pat Nelson. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.